Hey guys, I'm back. We are continuing the Shore Road Mystery, book six of the Hardy Boys. We are on chapter 15, and I got some bad news. My book's starting to come apart. This is an old book, too. So, anyway, let's continue with chapter 16. It's called Double Attack. Desperately shaking his head, Frank pushed open the door and pulled his brother outside into the rain. Leaning against the wall, he breathed in large drafts of air. Mumbling, Joe revived. What happened? Don't know, but I have a fair idea. Frank shut off the car motor and opened all the windows wide. My guess is carbon monoxide. I don't get it. We left the windows open enough so we shouldn't have had that much CO inside. Somebody may have clogged our exhaust. Frank investigated, but nothing was stuffed into it now. The warehouse was dark. I wonder when the men left, Joe said, disappointed. The brothers crossed. The silent, dark street. The warehouse door was locked, so the Hardys peered over the fence into the lot. The yard was strewn with junk, including numerous heaps of rusted piping and battered automobiles. Well, chalk off one wasted night, Joe said as they returned to the car. It wasn't exactly dull, Frank smiled. I have a hunch our friend's shipment may come off tomorrow night. Maybe the weather changed Slagle's mind. By late the next morning, the weather had cleared. After wiring their father, the boys repaired the car exhaust, which they found had been punctured in several places. I wonder when those crooks did this, said Frank, probably before we left here last night. After lunch, Frank and Joe drove out to the Dodd farm for their appointment with Martin Dodd. Parking near the barn, they got out and waited. Presently, Frank looked at his watch. The professor should be here by now. Fifteen minutes later, the brothers walked to the back of the house. Here, the ground was still muddy from the previous night's rain. Frank point, pointed out a confused jumble of footprints, and suddenly Joe stumbled on a hard object in the mud. Looking down, he gasped in alarm. It was a broken half of a smashed telescope. The professor must have been in a scuffle, he said. Nearby, Frank found a dead bat. Both boys recalled the one they had seen on the beach some days before. I may be crazy, said Joe, but I wonder if somebody's leaving these dead bats around on purpose. Finding no clues to Mr. Dodd's whereabouts, Frank and Joe drove away. I'm worried, Joe, said Frank. If Slag on his gang have captured the professor, Every move we make may endanger the lives of three people. I wonder, Joe replied, if the professor came upon a clue to the car hideout. Or the answer to the Pilgrim mystery, Frank added. The Hardy stopped at headquarters to report the professor's seeming disappearance. Chief colleague was concerned and said that he would order his men to conduct the search. Back at the house, Frank and Joe found a coded telegram had arrived for them. It's from dad, Joe said. Boys, have learned we are working on the same case. Milliman, member of gang smuggling gas. Weapons to hidden arsenal somewhere nearby Bayport. Watch dock. Same case, Joe exclaimed. Milliman's traffic in gases could explain the liquid gas. Frank went for Slaggle's telegram to Milliman and read the opening aloud. More nerve now, trying for eight-cylinder stock. The words seemed to take on different meaning and a far graver one. Eight cylinders of nerve gas, Frank said grimly, probably smuggled and then shipped up the coast to Slaggle's gang. That must be why Dad wants us to watch the docks. The young sleuths decided to watch both the junkyard and the dark docks that night. They phoned Chet and asked him to come over. When their stout friend arrived, he entered the crowd lab hesitantly. You fellas been cooking up something? Joe grinned. Chet, have you ever heard of the wooden horse? 
Sure. Wasn't that the roadblock of people Troy used to get out, to keep out the attacking Greeks? Not exactly, Frank laughed. It was a huge gift from the Greeks to the Trojans, but they had really packed the horse with soldiers. When the Trojans accepted the gift, the Greeks were able to get inside the city walls and defeat them. What of it? Chet shrugged. We have a similar plan. Frank clarified his remark. We've decided that if everything else fails, there's one way we might blow this case wide open. That's to buy a car and allow it to be stolen. Buy a car? Chet exclaimed. Yes, Joe and I have enough money to buy a second-hand sedan at Harpertown, where we're unknown. If it's flashy enough, Slaggle's gang may steal it out on Shore Road, and us too. Our car will have a large trunk and we'll be in it. Chet shook his head, and I suppose you'll ask me to drive it. The Hardys grinned, but did not answer. Instead, they said they wanted Chet to help them that evening. They would use Mr. Hardy's car. By 9 o'clock, the car was parked between two automobiles a block away from the junkyard. Presently, Slagle arrived and, a, and great activity became evident around the lighted lot. Kitcher moved about making notes on the clipboard as men carried metal junk inside the building. Milliman was nowhere in sight. I guess he works behind the scenes and is the brains of the whole operation, Frank whispered. Soon, several tow trucks bearing Kitcher's name rolled out of the warehouse and headed down hill towards the docks. Tied behind each of them were five battered cars. They couldn't be stolen, Chet said. Nobody would buy them. As the warehouse door closed, the boys decided to follow the shipment and Frank drove off. Reaching the docks, he parked near a row of steel drums behind which the boys stationed themselves. The lights of a barge glittered in the waters of Barment Bay. The name Arachne was painted on its side in white letters. The dilapidated cars were being unhitched from the tow trucks and rolled excuse me, towards the barge. In an hour, all the junk cars had been loaded onto the barge. Several loads of rusted wire and sheet metal followed. Slaggle and Kitcher returned to their cars. A whistle sounded over the churning water, and then slowly, the Arachne backed into the dark bay towards the south. Come on, let's take the sleuth, Frank motioned. The boys reached the hardy boathouse in record time. A minute later, the sluice motor roared to life. A night wind fluttered at their backs as they reached the mouth of Barnett Bay. Joe peered through field glasses. There it is, he cried. The lights of the arachne moved slowly down the coast. Her bow and stern lamps off. The sluice increased speed. When Frank had swung further out to sea, he headed parallel to the coast. Abreast of the barge, he throttled down to six knots. We can't do this forever, Chet protested. They'll catch on. Frank flipped off his shoes. I'm getting a closer look at what and who's on that barge. You're crazy, Joe protested. You wouldn't have a chance against all of them. I'll be careful. Keep the sleuth on course and give me about 20 minutes. Before Joe could say anything more, Frank was overboard and swimming toward the ghostly lights. He was midway between the two crafts when Joe saw the black fishing boat. Joe stiffened with fear as he deciphered the international coded, code message, which was being flashed by lights from the fishing boat to the barge. O N E O F H O H A R D Y K I D S S W I M M I N G T O D W A R D Y O U S T O P H I M E. One of Hardy kids swimming towards you. Stop him. 
Job jumped into the water instantly and swam towards his brother. Frank, fighting strong currents, had not noticed the warning. Minutes later, he reached the barge and caught his breath. Then, grasping the damp wood with his wet hands, he pulled himself and up and slid noiselessly over the side next to a braced car. Suddenly, someone struck him a hard blow on the head. His next sensation was of falling to the water. Frank blacked out before he reached it, but revived as he felt two arms grab him and take him to the surface. Desperately, Joe bore his brother through the waves to the darkened sluice as the noise of the barge motors became fainter and fainter. Joe was almost at the end of his strength when he touched the hole of the sluice. Chet leaned over and hauled Frank semi-conscious aboard. The next instant, Joe heard Chet cry out and saw him topple backwards out of sight. Grabbing the rail, Joe swung into the stern of the boat. To his horror, Chet lay motionless beside Frank. Joe whirled to face the attacker, a muscular black figure in a glistening diving suit. The man raised a sharp, dripping piton and lunged at Joe. And that's the end. So, I'm going to have to see what happens. We're almost at the end.